what do we want to do today is um, talk a little bit more about some of the things that we talked about on Wednesday um, and also push the envelope a little bit and, and start to look at how sometimes we have situations where we have a real kind of disconnect um, between our our healthcare choices and what it is that we're trying to do in, in the rest of our world and, and on the land. And I know that uh, for folks that have used holistic management, for example, uh, a lot of times one of the things that drives people into doing holistic management, some of it is desperation, certainly, but a lot of times it's to reconcile those kinds of disconnects that we, that we see in, in, um, in our uh, farming and ranching practices. Just like to take a little moment to thank the organizers for their work on another super gathering and certainly thank you to the attendees and all of you guys who are taking time away from your days and trying to keep the wheels rolling in your farms and ranches and businesses and stuff. So I, I want to create some context for the latter part of our discussion and, and to do that we're going to do a really quick review about our discussion from that we had on Wednesday um, in that in that afternoon and evening session, and and in that session we talked about the different meanings and derivations uh, for science. The science that we know, the sciatory that we know by splitting and reducing and knowing every little thing about the tiniest little parts, and the scientia science that we know by experience. Um, and that, that we become an expert in things because of our experience. Um, those two things are, are um, different. You know, there's the, the vitalist and the reductionist, the empiricism and the rationalism, and, and just realizing, I think, to have intelligent, meaningful conversations that, that recognizing that there's those two points of view, at least those two points of view, around science and, and, and what we call science. Um, the other thing that we, we look at when we're talking about that experiential science, the vitalism science, is that we, nothing is 100% certain. So as I said on Wednesday, I could see 200 cows with the same diagnostic label, and when I see 201, it's a brand new day because I've never seen that cow in that situation before. So we bring the body of knowledge together but it's also a brand new um, experience. And so we can never say always, and we can never say never. We also talked about in homeopathy that the, the scientific method of homeopathy is the scientia, the knowing by experience. And the fact that we're obser observing and describing the totality of what's going on in the situation. And we're looking for the pattern of that situation, both in the unique symptoms of the individual or group and doing that pattern recognition. We, we, look, at, um, we look at homeopathy as a, as a experiential, empirical system of medicine based on vitalistic vitalism principles. We did a little comparison about biomedicine with the materialism and the reductionism and, and the generalities and trying to put all the things into a common box the difference between the dynamic way of homeopathy, looking at the whole of, of the, the individual as well as the environment, looking at the individualities, what makes this individual or this group with this diagnostic label different than every other individual group that we've ever seen with the same label. And we really talk a lot about getting things in tune so that they're running on all cylinders. We also mentioned that, I also mentioned that the uh, Hahnemann Monument in Washington, D.C. is totally beautiful. If you ever get a chance to see it, do. But it's the only monument in Washington, D.C. actually to the uh, honor and, and memory of a physician. We also talked about sometimes um, we just need to rearrange in our, in, our, in our heads, either take some old ideas and put them to the side for the moment as we explore ideas. Sometimes as we make those explanations, we find that those old ideas and those old ways don't serve us anymore. And, and we move forward and we start looking, instead of looking at that mechanistic reductionist way, we start looking at holes. And we start looking at the farm as a whole organism. We start looking at the herd as a whole being. We start looking at the individual as a whole. And just like we talk about in holistic management, 
we have holes within holes within holes within holes. And, and in having our conversations and our assessments, we have to think about what hole is it that we're managing. And, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that as we talk about healthcare choices. The other thing that's really interesting is that when we think about illnesses and diseases in this <clears throat> paradigm, then illness or disease or diagnostic label is really a complex ecological system. Um, and, and, and it's a situation that doesn't occur in a vacuum. It happens at significant times. It's manifest in significant places with significant symptoms for both the environment, the whole that it's in, and also for the herd and also for the individual. And, and when we wanna treat from this perspective, we really wanna shift the tendency to have those, those imbalances and those illnesses. And we wanna back and ask in our treatment plan, are we indeed removing the root cause or are we just batting around at, at some of the more uh, worrisome or peripheral symptoms? And so just when we're doing the same way as if we're doing holistic management solutions and looking at what's the root cause for this situation, so is the same when we look at, at these, kinds of, these kinds of situations. We clarified the difference between homeopathic as far as potentizing, diluting, and succussing a substance over, over serial dilutions, or in the way that we're going to talk about homeopathy in this context is actually matching the symptoms of the disease or the imbalance in the individual or group with the symptoms of the medicine. And so the actual matching of, of that is very important and very significant. We talked about how the homeopathic medicine really works and, and we understand that there's primary chemical effects of medicines and the secondary response of the body is opposite to that primary chemical effect. And so in, in, in conventional medicine land, we have a fever, we give an anti-fever medicine, the body's response is to make more fever. We counter that with another dose of the anti-fever medicine, the body's response is to make more fever. In the short term, that can work out okay in self-limiting things, but in longer situations, that becomes problematic because the body is always pushing back and making the symptoms that, that are opposite from, from what the medicine is demanding of the body. And we also talked about how when we think like homeopaths and act like homeopaths, we minimize the primary chemical effect of the medicine by our dilutions and our dose. And we're actually giving the medicine for the secondary response of the body. And that's why we get so uh, both excited and interested in matching the symptoms and the modalities and the modifiers. So I may have a fever that's worse in the sun that makes my ears bright red and makes me not want to drink water. And I can take those symptoms together, find a medicine that has those symptoms in it, give a tiny little dose of that me medicine. It pushes a tiny little bit with the primary chemical effect of the medicine and the body has a, that secondary response that takes things back into, into appropriate equilibrium. We talked about how some people use homeopathy as a substitution for compliance. Oh my gosh, I'm certified organic, so I can't use antibiotics anymore, so I better do something. Um, they could care less what they do as long as it works for the rules and regulations of the system they're working in. We know some people use, you know, this is the crisis of the moment and we're, we're going to deal with this particular symptom or this particular group of symptoms. We know that sometimes folks want to use uh, an individual or a group over time and, and start looking at their symptoms that way. And the thing that I really get excited with uh, with homeopathy, and particularly uh, for those of us who work as, with, with livestock and, and animals, is that we actually can have intergenerational enhancement of vitality and health. And, and it happens in humans too, we just have to wait longer to, longer to see it. And certainly, uh, you know, we talk about three generations when we talk about these changes, we can certainly in, in see improved health in the parental generation and the first generation of offspring and, and the second generation. Uh, it, it's obvious you'll see it in your lifetime. Just a reminder here that the curative pattern of response is it has a certain pattern with certain characteristics. And we, we also talked about not being tricked 
by, by symptoms that are common to the diagnostic label that usually don't give us a whole lot of information as homeopaths. Uh, we see a lot of symptoms that result from errors in diet and management, and it's really dumb to treat those with medicine when we should, could be treating them with uh, hygiene and diet and management. Uh, hygiene in this, in, in this context is not like wash your hands and kill the germs, but it's all of those things that we do with the whole uh, food, water, air, shelter, uh, uh, handling, all of those things. This is really important. It's one of the big bees in my bonnet, um, talking about things that disturb health, that maintain disease, and how to remove those from healthy people. So we see a lot of things in humans and all, probably 90% of what we see in, in veterinary medicine and food animals and production animals is, is because of those things. We reminded ourselves that monogastrics and ruminants work way differently. There's metabolic differences, there's nutritional differences, and there's management differences. And my premise is that a lot of the things that we're called to treat is because we treat ruminants like they're monogastric animals. So we feed cattle like hogs instead of feeding cattle like the ruminants that they are. Uh, same thing with hogs. We just, we just, um, we just hyper move them, uh, you know, into really, uh, you know, let's feed them a lot, let's feed them fast, let's get them in and out quick. And we also talked about pattern recognition and recognizing patterns in our in our environment and also recognizing patterns and symptoms and also recognizing patterns in the, the medicines that we're using. Talked about the importance of learning how to speak beast, uh, same way that we learn how to speak land, looking at assessing the, the health and vitality of animals, even though they might look like they're not in the super best of situations, we can still see signs in these individuals that they're managing really, really well. And to show that the halen stripen are not just uh, seen in the, in the dairy herds, but we could see them in beef herds as well. I'll say it again today what, what I said on Wednesday, if you take nothing back from this, this slide to me is the most important what the power of species appropriate management and the power of species appropriate husbandry, both in animal health, land management and, and, and health, soil and forage, uh, increasing carrying capacity, diversity both in the herd as well as in the sward, and also for the, the uh, mental and emotional and physical health of, of not just the animals in the land, but also of the caretakers. And, and, and talking about the, the power of that. For those of you who do holistic management and, and don't do homeopathy yet, there's a lot of similarities for, between the two things. And for those of you who are homeopath central and never have explored holistic management, it's really interesting how there's a lot of the fundamentals that are, that are similar. There's a continuum in the plan that we use, and that plan often varies with the situation and the choice of, of the farmer or rancher, just like a grazing plan might vary in those different circumstances. The more we work with the plan, the more success we're gonna have. I've always said, and I say to people that I coach and advise, you know, the hardest thing we're ever gonna do is write that first grazing plan or write that first financial plan or even write your first holistic context plan. That's the hardest thing. The ones that come after, are, they get much easier. And homeopathy, just like holistic management, works better if it's not applied for crisis management. The fundamental thing that so many people struggle with is, on, and the horns of the dilemma to me and a lot of my friends and colleagues and, and, I, and the people that I've met in the Regenerate group uh, and also the organizations that have gathered together in this meeting is how do we want it to be? And what are we satisfied with? Are we satisfied with the current agricultural, pharmaceutical, industrial model? Um, how do we want to create and support systems that actually support form and function and sustainability and structure? And how do we get animals that are built to do what it is that they're doing in their world? They have the temperament and the physical and metabolic ability per, to perform an environment that we have them in, how do we manage herd and family dynamics, fostering and allowing natural behaviors, and how, what kind of influences does this have on our ecologic environment, our other 
environmental considerations of pollutants and toxins and, and burdens on land and air and water. What does that look like in economic ways? Um, what does it look like in human and animal welfare ways? What are the social and regional implications of doing this? And those are the things that we struggle with a lot, a lot, a lot. So how do we make decisions on our farms and on our ranches and for our businesses and for our family and for ourselves and our livestock and our land? So many of the people that I meet that are gathered at meetings like this are in some ways either opting out might be a strong word for some and maybe not for not strong enough for others, but, but they find that there's some things that really don't make sense in the conventional agribusiness model. You know, they're kind of doing all the best management practices and it's not working for them or it's not resonating with their heart and soul or they intuitively know that their animal health and their land health and the human dynamic stuff that's happening could be and should be better. Um, we, we see all of those kinds of struggles. I talk to folks who spend a lot of time and energy not having the big agribusiness influence on the land and stock that they have under management. And, and then when something happens, when and they get sick or their animals get sick, the first thing they reach for are, are medications and substances made by the companies that they've spent a lot of time and energy trying to avoid um, supporting. So, so when we, we start looking at holistic management, for, for you guys that know holistic management, we know it's a decision-making, planning, and monitoring process. And it's measured by the triple bottom line of the economic, social, and environmental yardsticks. We know that it has foundational pillars in land management, in, in financial planning, in, in um, resource management, and, and follow-up. Um, and we know that it can be applied to all sorts of situations. We just have to look at what the whole that we want to apply it to, whether that's your personal life, whether that's your family life, whether it's your business, whether it's a subunit of your business, uh, whether it's your chicken pasturing entity of your larger diversified farming, or indeed, as in this conversation today, whether it's the healthcare practices in your, in your, larger, um, your larger whole and your larger enterprise. One of the really fundamental things in holistic management is that holistic context for the whole we're, we're, we're talking about. And, and that basically is how do you want it to be? What's the quality of life that you want? What forms of production are you going to use to, to, to uh, attain and, and track that quality of life? And what's the future resource base that, that we um, are planning towards and, and, and looking at down the, down the road? The thing that I often see gets to be the biggest error or a big error is we talk a whole lot about how am I going to get there as opposed to where do you want to be? And I've seen farmer after farmer after farmer after farmer, rancher after rancher who leaves farming and ranching because they get stuck in the idea that they want to have dairy cows uh, as opposed to we want to have animals on the land. So they can't make that transition from dairy to beef. They can't make that transition from raising black and white cattle to raising cattle of a different color. They can't make it, they're bound and determined they're going to raise sheep and nothing else will suit. And, and, and those are all the how are we going to get there questions, you know, and, and it's not where do you want to be. And so as we explore the use of homeopathy specifically and natural medicines, perhaps more uh, in, in a broader context, think about that question is, where do you ultimately want to be? And then how do we build the, how do you get there um, uh, ladder and steps? <clears throat> One of the fundamental things in holistic management is how do we prioritize energy? Energy is time, energy is money. How do you decide what the best use of your time and energy and money would be? And for the whole that's under management, we need to talk about or think about what are log jams? What, are, what might be happening that's preventing the whole thing from moving forward? Or what is something that might be a weak link in your production cycle from converting you know, sun to forage forage to cattle, cattle to meat, and out the door to your customer. And there, 
the, those identifying those things are the things that allow us to prioritize the best use of time and energy and money. And remind me that I said that as we talk about cases, if I don't, don't remember to make that distinct point. We also, we also know that these are the, the, the holistic management questions that we run through uh, fairly quickly when we're trying to decide what is it that we're going to do, what's the, what's the, what are our choices, um, you know, does it, does, it, does it address the root cause, does it address the weak links, what's the biggest bang for our buck. We can talk really quickly about some gross profit analysis. If I do this, this happens. If I do that, that happens. And, and looking about where are we gonna get the energy and money to do what we're, what we're doing? Uh, is it sustainable in the, long in the long run? And sort of that gut thing, you know, how, how, how does it influence and interact with the general society and culture? And also kind of what's our gut reaction to, to what it is that we're talking about doing. So now I want to review some things about the current state of healthcare. And I am really bad with numbers. And I say bad with, I can add and subtract and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. But, but I'm bad with numbers because I talk about these numbers and they get so big and crazy. You just think, oh my gosh, what do these numbers really mean? As I said on Wednesday with this, this slide of the sort of nutritional analysis of things, I personally would flip corporate influence and outdated science. Um, so <clears throat> these are just some numbers, <clears throat> take them for what they are. On the human side, advertising for direct to consumer advertising budget, just the advertising budget in the United States, all of these numbers are in US dollars. $1.3 billion in 1997, $6 billion direct to consumer advertising budget in the United States in, in 2016. I'm not even sure I know quite what a billion of anything looks like in a pile. When we look, when we look at the total marketing budget for prescription drugs, $26 billion in 2016, $18 billion in 1997, and $30 billion in 2019. Now, I could have been fancy and built a graph and all that sort of stuff, and I, I didn't do that. But we know if we put those numbers side by each by each, that our slope of the graph is increasing um, quite, it's got a really market increased slope. We look at 20. 21, the top three yearly drug advertising expenses on US television, television only, no print media, no social media, no going to the doctor's offices with your pharmaceutical reps and, and you know, uh, hyping a, a drug, uh, representing a drug, not, none of the free samples, none of that sort of stuff. This is just drug advertising expenses for US television stations. So the top three drugs, I didn't even, I knew what, I actually knew what Humira was. Uh, I knew the family names of the, of the other things, but I didn't recognize the prescription names. So I had to go and ask the doc to, to clarify those things. When we look at $287 million a year for one medication um, that, that um, to, on TV advertising, the next is 225, the next is 176 million. That's like $688 million a year spent on TV advertising for just these three drugs. And the st statisticians say for every thousand dollars of expenditure on direct to consumer TV advertising, we get 24 patients that gets signed up on those drugs. So I could have done the math, but honestly, I got lazy. So I don't know if you divide $688 million by a thousand and multiply that by 24 patients, that's a lot of patients in 2021 that got put on those medications. And again, the size of the scale of this overwhelms me. 
you know, I can count. I know what things look like in groups. Um, I know, you know, that the sign says that there's however many million people, 2.76 million people in Toronto, for example. So you get a sense of how big that is. But, but the scale is really quite amazing, um, is really quite amazing. The other thing <clears throat> that's interesting to me, when you look at the top three drugs <clears throat> that in advertising right now, last year, in the United States, they're very, it's very interesting because they are all involved with inflammation kind of stuff. So the Humira is, is a huge anti-inflammatory drug. We know that, that type 1 di diabetes has got a lot to do with inflammation and immune-mediated disease with, with pancreatic and function and recognition of insulins and stuff. And, and we look at the anti-inflammatory interleukin inhibitors as well. And I, I don't think that that's a by chance thing. So, so I think that's, you know, just worth composting about at some point when we look at the, 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 the huge amount of, of medicine that's used to reduce inflammation. And we start thinking about other ways that we can stop creating inflammation. Um, enough said. When we look at the global pharmaceutical market at the end of 2021, it's 1.42 trillion US dollars. I'm not even sure that I know how big a trillion is. If I saw a trillion of anything sitting there, maybe I would understand it if I looked at a piece of, of land and thought about the trillions of, of soil microbes or something underneath there. But to see a stack of a trillion somethings, I, I, I don't know how big that is. And, and Again, looking in the 20 years, it went from 390 billion to 1.42 trillion in 20 years. That's a global pharmaceutical market. When, when we talk on the veterinary side, when we, and it's like really tiny compared to the human side, when we look at the global veterinary drug market, we're looking at you know 17.8, almost 17.9 million dollars in 2017, and 27 and a half million dollars by 2025. And you know of that, North American revenue is almost seven million dollars in 2017. Interestingly, if you look at the categories of medicines in those big piles of dollar figures, the the parasiticides. Um, count for about a third of that. And the anti-infectives and anti-inflammatories are about divided equally for the bulk of the rest of it. I found it really interesting that they used anti-infectives and, and uh, did some hunting to see indeed what in this context do they mean by the, by the word anti-infective and I couldn't get a clear answer. So I'm gonna go back and check that um, and, and see. You know, you'd think, initially you'd think, oh, like maybe they're just talking about antibiotics, but I also think a lot of times, you know, that it, vaccine revenue could be in that as well, uh, because a lot of vaccines are thought to be anti-infective. So I go back, how big is this really? And go back to say that the drug companies that were getting this data from and about are the same companies that are making the fertilizers and the pesticides, they're developing and selling the seeds. Um, they're, they're, you know, and that we look at all of that interconnected kinds of <clears throat> kinds of things that we do. Um, that we fix one issue with another issue with another issue with another issue with another issue, all using um, medications and solutions that are marketed by the same relatively small group of companies. Uh, that are both creating and solving problems in a perpetual snake eating its tail kind of situation. Enough said. People wonder sometimes <clears throat> when they hear these kinds of conversations about, yeah, but Sue, does this other stuff really work? And, and we want science and we want proof and, and we don't wanna hear all these sort of anecdotal things that you talk about or your colleagues talk about or other people talk about. And I don't really care what Farmer Brown's cow did on Thursday or uh, you know, Mrs. Jones' Fifi cat did or, or what happened in this group of animals. You know, we want real science and we want published papers and stuff. And, and if folks are interested in published papers in real science, feel free to send me an email. We've got a big old stack of, uh, of that stuff about homeopathy uh, that goes back actually quite a few 
uh, quite a few centuries. Um, some more recent ones talking about the reduced use of antimicrobials on farm using integrative veterinary care, medical care, especially homeopathy, and looking how we saw um, 33% decrease um, in the use of antimicrobial treatments on the farm, both in the amount and the number of treatments per, <clears throat> per animal. We looked at, uh, there's a really nice uh, study looking at uh, a meta-analysis data, looking at the effectiveness of homeopathy in treating and preventing mastitis in cattle. Um, the, the studies varied. Uh, one study that was particularly notable uh, talked about a reduction in the use of anti antibiotics by up to 75%. There's a study here talking about using uh, homeopathic medicines to uh, treat E. coli diarrhea in piglets, and they found that those, the group treated with the homeopathic medicines had fewer piglets with diarrhea. They only had 10 out of the 250 versus a 63 in the 202 group in the placebo group. And we also saw that they had less severity of the disease. They weren't as sick. They didn't poop as bad. And the diarrhea, the, the duration of the clinical signs were much shorter in, in the homeopathically treated piglets. This was a study in humans about people with sepsis with deep blood borne infections. They were in ICU, they had standard therapy, they treated with uh, homeopathic medicine or placebo and looking at the day 180 survival group with the people that were treated with individualized homeopathic remedies were statistically higher than the people who were treated with conventional medicine and placebo. This is a really interesting uh, series of, of reports that were written talking about comparison of veterinary drugs and veterinary homeopathy. So the first part is kind of more philosophical and uh, historical and explanation point part. And the second part talks about really looking at uh, some specific situations and assessing uh, the, this from that and, and comparing situations and comparing results and, and, and that sort of thing. It's quite, it's, it's not a fluffy read, but it's not like a beat your head against the wall, uh, drag on horrible read either. And um, that, that uh, reference material is there. And I'm quite sure that we can get that to anybody who's interested. So <clears throat> the other thing that we find is there's a really, really common criticisms of homeopathy and other natural medicines. And I hear this all the time. I hear it from my colleagues in the integrative veterinary world. Um, and I, I hear it certainly all the time from the other team that's in the conventional medicine camp that we can't use individualized medicines at scale. It's totally impossible to do. Oh yeah, this stuff is really good if you're just treating one cow or one pig or two cows or two pigs. But you know, like real farms and real ranches have lots of cows and lots of pigs and this is impossible to use. It works way too slowly and we can't manage a crisis or if we have something that's like really sick or if they got some really bad, scary disease, it's too slow, it, it just can't manage those things. And when you're told it takes too long to do, you know, it needs you need too much information. You spend all this time asking questions. You need the extended conversations with the with the farmers and ranchers. Um, you have all these questions, you know, like, and they have to go and look at their animals and spend some time with their animals and being able to translate things into, you know, what's going on into into symptoms that we can find useful. I also hear that it's only for those like organic or transitioning to organic farmers and ranchers or for the people with pets or for the people who eat granola or wear Birkenstocks or, or something like that. And, and, and that gets, you know, that gets told to me a lot, a lot, a lot. We'll refute, I think every one of those in our case examples. I wanna reiterate the advantages of using homeopathic medicines there is no resistance to the medicine. We've not seen any uh, resistance of any organism or any situation to appropriately chosen homeopathic medicines. There's no withdrawals for meat or milk and eggs. In addition to no withdrawals, there's no tissue residues. Uh, we have lots of situations where we have animals um, 
uh, drugs that have withdrawal times in animals uh, where we can still go in to the tissue and actually still find residues of those particular medications or in the milk or in the eggs, but it's below the, the level that the regulatory authorities have decided is significant. So not only do we have no withdrawal time, we have no residue. We tend to find a faster return to production. We always see improved long-term health and in situations where we are doing breeding animal work, we see improved intergenerational health. And that's so, so, so powerful. The using the homeopathic um, medicines reduces the susceptibility to disease. And it's got a really interesting ecological footprint when we think about how much material do we need to start with to actually make those dilutions and succussions to get the little pellets that, that we all see, you know, when we have, uh, when we have our vials of homeopathic medicines. And, and we have, I have medicines in my collection that are from the 1800s um, that are still effective and still, you know, are still useful. Um, we, we can, it's really ecological and economic sense as far as the use of, of substance to actually create the medicine. And that's something that we see much different than is the case in certainly conventional uh, uh, pharmaceuticals and also as well in, in sometimes in uh, some of the herbal preparations as well. So <clears throat> if there's no, no particular questions or nothing happening that I can see happening in the chat box, what I'd like to spend the time doing for the rest of our time together is going through some, some cases. And <clears throat> there's a variety of different kinds of cases here. Uh, I think they're all farm animals at this point. I had some companion animal cases um, on the Wednesday. And I wanna talk about the situation, gonna re-summarize some cases that we might have seen on Wednesday. And I also want to talk about what actually was the cost of doing this kind of medicine, the result of doing this kind of medicine. And these aren't cherry picked cases necessarily. I picked them because they're really representative of common things that we see. And they're also representative in my eyes of some of the things that I hear people saying, oh, this doesn't work because. So let's just work through these these particular cases and, and see. This one is an unusual case. It is not this calf, but it's a calf in a similar situation. Uh, it's, a, it's a small organic grass-fed herd in the Northeast. This was a case that actually I treated uh, probably in September of this year. So I don't have a really long-term follow-up, but I have a short-term interesting follow-up. And this case came um, on a listserv from a group of organic dairy people. And, and, the, and the person um, wrote a letter and said, hey guys, uh, what do you all know about treating calves with Peyton, foramen, or Valet? And that was the thing. And for those of you who don't know what a Peyton, foramen, or Valet is, is it's actually a, an interconnection of, of two sides of the heart that are connected in, in, uh, in utero uh, when, the, when the calf's gestating and, and when they're born, uh, probably through the push of going through the birth canal, though that connection um, closes and, and the, the animal is breathing air and you know, dividing the circulatory system from the lungs and the heart and the, the ventricles are separate from each other and not intercommunicating. And so basically what this calf has is a hole between the chambers of the heart. There's impaired circulation. There's very low blood oxygen. She's had really good colostrum. We know uh, the calf is not got a fever, is not sick in any other way, but it's got this physical malformation in the heart. She's weak. She's very short of breath. She pants with exertion. She has very pale mucous membranes. She, she wants to go out and do things. She's interactive in her environment, but she just can't get, the, get the, the physiology to sort of keep up with the spirit of the body. And, and when she finally flops down, it, it takes a while, but her respiratory rate eventually comes down, but it's a much higher than normal respiratory rate. 
And if you listen to her chest, you don't even need a stethoscope to listen to her chest, but she's got a big sloshing heart murmur. It sounds like a washing machine. So <clears throat> what happened in this situation is I sent the lady an email and I said, hey, you want to talk homeopathy? I'm game. We can talk on list or we can talk off list. So the, the gal phoned me and, and um, the approach that I took was to try and get a little bit more information because all we have right now in this situation is big common physical symptom. Like we've got a physical symptom diagnosis. You've got a calf that's got a hole in the heart and we've got really common symptoms of the diagnostic label. Like there's nothing really unique about this calf. I would expect to see them doing all of those things that we just described with that physical abnormality. So what I was trying to figure out is, was there anything going on with this calf that made it different than uh, or unique for all the other calves that have holes in the heart? And then the other thing that I did before I called the lady was I did a backwards thing that we can really do fun ways now that we have all of this electronic um, reference material. So instead of flipping through the paper books, I actually did a search in the collection of homeopathic literature over the centuries for patent foramen ovale. And there was actually only five remedies that have ever been talked about in that, in that particular uh, diagnosis. And so um, I I read those remedies. And so I sort of knew what I might need to talk about with this, with this lady. Um, and we found out that the little calf uh, didn't like being manipulated, didn't like being caught up, didn't like being examined, didn't like being restrained. And of all the remedies that, that we had um, that have been effective historically, they've got data that they treated cases of this and they got better. Um, there's only one remedy that doesn't like being restrained. Uh, that's that's it's quite personable, uh, and 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 it doesn't like being held, and it doesn't like having like a collar around its neck and that sort of thing. So I gave the calf, uh, the client, the owner, um, gave the calf a dose of lachesis, and and literally uh, within oh probably ten minutes she texted me and she said, oh my gosh, Sue, he's breathing heavier. He looks worse. He fell over. He's really panting. This doesn't look really, you know, like I'm thinking, holy moly, I wonder, you know, and she only had a particular potency of the lachesis. So I wondered if maybe we had dosed the, the calf too high. And I thought, none of these are new symptoms. Let's just let things settle down and, you know, take three deep breaths and see what happens in a couple of hours. The calf settled down. And within the next couple of days, the resting respiratory rate went down. The, it was able to move around without panting as hard. It took less time to recover after it, when it finally did flop down. And she talked to me about a week later to say that you could hardly hear the murmur anymore. And the calf was galloping around, uh, looked like the rest of the, the herd, essentially. It still had a higher than I would expect uh, physiological respiratory rate, but it wasn't grossly high. It was probably about, about I, I don't have the numbers in my head. It was, it's about 10, 15% higher than you would expect with, with a calf. So, you know, we're not going to open her up and see if the hole closed, um, but we certainly know that we have an absence of murmur and, and she's working a, a whole lot better. And there's no reason to, to suspect that she's not going to, you know, at least be able to grow into a calf and perhaps join, uh, join the herd. So that was, a, that was a kind of interesting approach. So the question is, what did, what did that cost? Um, well, it didn't cost anything with clinicians time because there's a bunch of veterinarians on this particular organic dairy list and we just volunteer our time and our expertise. But it, it took me maybe 20, 20 minutes of, of time. And I bill out my farm animal work uh, differently than I bill out my companion animal work. Um, and I bill out my farm animal work at $60 an hour. And so save 20 bucks for my time. The remedy medicine she had, but if she had to go to the store and buy it, probably spend $7 and 50 cents for a, for a bottle of stuff that has, you know, uh, 60 to 150 tablets in it. So that costs, you know, go figure like pennies and, and the client's time to give 
the, the remedy and do the follow up on the up on the calf. So I think that's pretty good value, um, and it gives her a much more hopeful uh, a hopeful future than she had had we done nothing with it. The next case you, you saw this uh, you saw this slide the other day. This is to remind me to talk about the fact that there's a specific group of homeopathic medications called nosodes, and those nosodes are made from the product of the disease. So they have the susceptibility to the disease in there because the individual that we made the no sode from was exposed to the causative agent. It, it infiltrated the, the, the patient and they actually got sick. We're all exposed to causative agents of all sorts of things as are all of our livestock every day, but not everybody gets sick. So the fact that we got the sickness that says there's a susceptibility to that particular disease and, and by gathering up the product of the disease, which might be snot or lung junk or diarrhea or exudate from somewhere, that, that product uh, actually contains within it that, that susceptibility. And so we can make unique nosodes for specific circumstances. And there are also some commercially available nosodes. I wanna reiterate, these things are not a panacea. They work by filling in the susceptibility chink in the armor of the individual so that when the naturally occurring disease floats by, there's no place for it to grab onto. And, and if you get the timing and, and understand the type of diseases that this works for and understand the dosing, um, they can be really, really effective. That, that slide that I just showed uh, of, the, of the fowl pox turkey, uh, the, the owner made some no sowed from the goo out of the lesions and treated not only the sick turkeys, but also her laying hands. Uh, the laying hands didn't miss, miss a beat as far as laying eggs go. Usually if they are exposed to fowl pox, their egg production tanks. Uh, the turkeys that were sick, recovered very, very quickly, and she didn't get any more sick turkeys in her flock. I wanna to talk to you about uh, uh, another turkey situation. It's definitely not these turkeys. Um, it was a situation in a conventional confinement barn, series of confinement barns. Um, and it was, a, it was a situation where they had a disease that's called ORT. It's a poultry disease. Uh, it's it's called it's from a, a an ornithobacterium. It causes um, respiratory diseases. It can cause uh, ear problems and it can cause joint problems. It's quite contagious. It goes uh, horizontally by direct contact. You know, snotting and sneezing and being on into contact with their brothers and sisters and 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 flock mates. Um, it also carries on fomites, so in animal ob inanimate objects like like feeders and shovels and your cell phone and your boots and, and that sort of stuff. We can carry it in feed and water. It's also aerosolized into the environment. Um, and it also can go vertically <clears throat> through the eggs. It mimics a lot of other respiratory pathogens. It often is concurrent. There's multiple pathogens happening at the same time. And there's a lot of people in the poultry industry that actually feel that a diagnosis of ORT uh, is a diagnosis of cumulative stress and other previous or concurrent infections, sort of like a diagnosis of coccidia in, 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 in hoof stock and, and, and um, other mammals. You know, uh, By the time we get coxy, uh, that's, that's an indicator that something else is off. If, if they're functioning really well otherwise, that, that shouldn't be an issue. And that's typically... Uh, so, so whenever we look at these ORT situations, we're always looking for what else is wobbly in the situation. The clinical signs and the severity and the duration and the mortality with ORT varies a lot between flocks. Uh, it depends on all those other husbandry and hygiene factors. It depends if it's the first time they've ever seen it or if it's kind of been smoldering. It depends on a whole bunch of things. As I say, it's respiratory signs predominate, but we also see joint signs and we see some ear issues. It is, as an organism, inconsistently susceptible to antibiotics. So you can't say antibiotics X, always get it. Sometimes this gets it, sometimes that gets it, sometimes nothing gets it. Um, 
part of the problem in poultry is there's a lot of presumptive treatment of diseases and there's a lot of use of antibiotics without diagnostics properly and they don't culture and due to cultures and sensitivities to say what really are these bugs susceptible to they're just going to put some antibiotics in and if it doesn't work we're going to put some more antibiotics in and y'all know uh you know it's the same as doing parasite control right that's the best best fastest way to build up resistant populations is to is to to use medicines in that manner and so the fact that there's a lot of presumptive treatment of respiratory disease in poultry it's made the treatment of ort really different and and it, and we also see an increased presence in the flocks and an increased resistance to antibiotics because we're actually almost self-selecting for those resistant strains so this was a situation where it was multiple turkey barns they were on one more or less location but there were several brother sister related locations and the history that i got when i finally got called in not finally got called in it was desperation and i happened to be in the area and oh by the way doc so there was lots of dead birds they had a huge mortality rate 30 40 50 60 plus percent they had the the thing that got the phone ring to call me was they just had 90 percent of a, of a 16,000 bird poultry slaughter, 90% of the barn was culled at slaughter. And they had had situations where they were actually going in and just killing um, all of the birds on the floor after that because they were doing so poorly, they had uneven growth, they looked like the birds that they culled 90% or 10 of them uh, at slaughter and tanked them all and they didn't want to go and, and slaughter. So I can't imagine going into a, into like, they start with 16,000 birds and they probably had, you know, closer to 10,000 birds or less uh, by the time they were making these choices, but, but they just killed them all and, and put them, put them, put them on the compost. And when I drove into this place for the first time, I was, I was stunned at their, at the piles of dead birds uh, from their from their daily deaths. And and part of me comes from a background where, you know, uh, they're grass fed farmers raising turkeys that look more like the turkeys that those nice white turkeys that were standing there in Greg Gunthorpe's pasture. Um, and, and those birds, you know, the the cost of those birds to purchase vary between, you know, 60 and $140, depending on on what what their market is. And so when I drive into a place and see if thousands of dollars of dead birds lying there it just makes my gut sore anyway the farmers were a bit reluctant to take some advice and they wanted to do it themselves they had huge management issues lots of hygiene issues lots of cross contamination between the houses they had leaking waters and wet bedding and crappy air quality and so the birds were already compromised and they had this history of suboptimal performance but they got so desperate that they actually did some diagnostics and and this is this is what they found was that they had ort and interestingly there wasn't any antibiotic that it was sensitive to because they did do a culture and sensitivity so so they're between a rock and a hard place and they were in a barn that was they tr they were trying to raise antibiotic free turkeys to boot so what we decided after a lot of talking and a lot of beating on heads and uh, you know like like this kind of stuff and trying to decide how they wanted to approach things is that they would purposefully understock the houses instead of putting those 16,000 birds in you know we were trying to get them in around 12,000 so that's going to reduce the crowding the stress and it just like if they're dying anyway why put them in to have them dead let's just start less and and they were committed to work to improve the ventilation and deal with the water leaks and deal with the bedding management because sloppy bedding or cap bedding doesn't work real well in poultry houses. They, they were gonna spend more time with the birds. And I almost, like, I almost can't fault the staff. When I talk to the, the farm staff, you can't fault them for not wanting to go in the barns because they've been trying to fix this for so long. And all they do is they go in and they walk and they see sick birds and dead birds. And how many more do we have to haul out? And it's hard to go to your job every day when that's what you get. And we decided that we were going to pay better attention to movement between human movement, I mean, between the flocks. So we dedicated one guy to work in the brooder 
And then we divided the other work by the ages of the birds and, and, the, and the houses. And we never, ever, ever let anybody go from an old bird house to a younger bird house. And we never, ever, ever let the guy who was in the brooder go any of the other ways. The other thing you gotta know about turkeys is they like humans and they perform better if they have some interaction with humans. And, and we actually have some science that, that shows that. We also didn't wanna share any equipment. And so we did all the sanitation and the hygiene thing. Feed and water in this situation, they're huge issues. They would have done really good to be able to change it. These guys couldn't, wouldn't, whatever, that wasn't gonna happen. So what we actually did was we cleaned out the houses from all these dead birds and we let things rest. We took all that crappy bedding, contaminated bedding out. We gave them a couple or three days. And then we went and we physically with a backpack sprayer sprayed the ground and the walls with a probiotic prebiotic mixture. And that did the cleaning helped shift the biofilm and the, and the probiotic prebiotic mixture sort of helped to repopulate the microflora of those houses in a more healthy manner. And then the other thing that we did was I got the guys to collect some snot and, and, and manure and lung exudates from these birds, uh, the, the, the alive sick birds, and I made a no sode from them. And for people who want to make no sodes, just send me an email and I'll send you the instructions. But we took a little bit of that and diluted and succussed and diluted and succussed and diluted and succussed. And, and there's all my little, you know, drop, 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 drop of, of Everclear that we use to dilute things with and, and my bottles that I shook, 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 shook. And, and, uh, and we ended up with, I think I ran that up to a 30 or 40 C as I recall. And then we sent the liquid back to those barns and they diluted that liquid into the, into water that we administered in the drinking water. And literally within a couple or three days of seeing that, they saw a shift. They, they, the birds quit dying, they didn't get sick. Um, they, they, uh, they had better, you know, they just, they just did better overall, even better than they'd done uh, after all of those changes, <clears throat> changes in the house. And, and so, um, the guys, I, I was sort of lost to the follow up with, with that because they were having really, really great results and they, they, they weren't having that big mortality rate. Their mortality rate went down to about, back down to about 6%. They were finishing the birds. They weren't having them tank at, at slaughter and they were happy guys. They didn't want to make any other changements. And, and um, I've, talked to, uh, I've talked to somebody who uh, provides their premix for them and he called actually just a couple of weeks ago and he wanted to know where to get more um, what we call blank pellets. They're, they're unmedicated pellets that we drip the remedy on to put one pellet in the water that we put in the dosimeter. And, and they sell, this is not a blank pellet container, but they sell them by the quart in a container about that big. And there's millions of pellets in that. Um, so they, you know, I don't think that we've, uh, we've fixed things as far as the root cause, but we certainly got happier barns. So how much did all this cost? My fees were part of a speaking tour. So, you know, I was out doing a speaking engagement for a couple hundred dollars and, and they put me in the truck and sent me out to this barn. So if I was, if I was gonna say, you know, what, what my fees would be, they'd be like a hundred, $150 for the time that I actually spent at the barn. The alcohol costs what the alcohol costs, um, the bottles and everything for dilution. And we bought a whole bunch cause we knew we'd be going on. Those bottles and everything were somewhere around $40. Um, the pellets cost, when they, we didn't have pellets when I first did this, so we sent it in liquid to them. But once they got the pellets and medicated the pellets with the liquid and, and had that look more like the homeopathic medicines that you guys are used to seeing in the stores, those pellets cost about $30 for that great big quart of pellets. So, so add, add that up. We're somewhere under $200, $250. Um, I'm not counting the, the, the time. Um, I guess I could be more accurate and count the the... Uh, hour that it took me to build the no sode and I'm not counting the farm staff time. I have no idea what it costs to kill a whole barn of turkeys. I, I mean, I could give you some guesses about what it costs to kill a whole barn of turkeys and nobody was real interested in, in talking about um, how much it was 
it, this whole outbreak had cost them in, in this particular operation. Uh, they were pretty desperate though, because they let a woman uh, come in and sit at the men's table in the dining room and they decided that they were gonna do some homeopathy. So it cost them more than $20. We're gonna do some genus epidemicus cases now. <clears throat> when we talked about genus epidemicus, that's treating the whole group as if they're one individual. And as we said on Wednesday, we only consider the new symptoms. We don't use the pre-existing symptoms. We don't use symptoms common to the diagnostic label. We treat the group with the medicine that we determine, and then we assess the response. They're either gonna be improved, they're not gonna change, or we're gonna see new symptoms. If they're improved, we wait. If there's no change, we repeat the dose. And if there's new symptoms, we reassess and, and change the medicine. So I'm gonna give you a couple of cases like this. This is, a, this is, again, not the herd, but it's a herd of um, uh, spontaneous abortion and big neonatal deaths and, a thrill and failure to thrive babies in a 200 head milking goat herd. They were having a 90% abortion rate when they called me. Uh, this was a, a, a herd in the Midwest. They called me when I was practicing in Pennsylvania. And the kids, the, the mamas didn't get pregnant or, or they either got pregnant and, and slipped their babies or they didn't get pregnant. And they were having a 90% abortion rate. The kids either died soon after birth or just were like these real woozily sick babies. And, and we were seeing infertility in the does. And they had seen all sorts of people. They'd had all sorts of diagnosis. They'd had all sorts of treatment. They worked through a couple of veterinarians. They'd gone to the university. They'd gone to the extension guys. They finally sent me sort of a big stack of records. Um, and, and that was kind of interesting. I'll tell you in a minute. There were huge environmental and management stressors here. They had 200 milking goats and offspring on two, maybe two and a third ac acres. And the primary herdsman was a 14 year old kid and his dad was busy at the sawmill on site, but, but he wasn't, he was so busy at the mill that, that he wasn't getting a lot of help with that. And, and so those goats, there wasn't gonna be a lot that we could do to actually change all of the things that I like to change first. You know, we're not gonna be able to give them more space. We're not gonna be able to ch change the feed and water and, and get a little more help for the herdsmen and, and that sort of stuff. I mean, we just had to work with what we had to work with. So what I did was I took all of those symptoms of the, the weak and sickly babies, the infertility, the late gestation abortions, and, and um, put them all together like I was treating one big goat. So the herd as the individual. I found a remedy medicine, um, which in this case was sepia. It doesn't really matter what the remedy was. I sent the remedy in a little bottle, just like this, off to the people in a little dropper bottle, put one pellet of sepia in, in this thing, and I mix it up with some spring water and a little bit of alcohol, vodka, to stabilize the solution, and I mailed it to him. And when he got there, he put the, he put the drops in a quart of water, then he put that quart of water into five gallons of water, and then he stirred that up, and he divided that, they these guys didn't have any automatic waters or anything. So we just divided that up in between the watering buckets for everybody on site. So we treated the whole group. And what happened was, um, and then I told them to call me back in 48 hours or 72 hours. And so what happened was they quit having abortions. And then what happened, uh, you know, fairly quickly after that, within those seven to 10 days, is the babies that were coming due were not born as weak. Uh, they weren't born dead and they weren't born as weak. So we got healthier look at babies and they quit aborting. And, and for there, we were happy. Then we had to wait, you know, as they started showing, showing them the buck to see whether or not these, these mamas were going to get pregnant again. And indeed, that's what happened. They quit aborting. The babies started being born alive, which is a good thing, uh, and healthier. And as time passed, now we're into weeks to month, um, months, the, the does got bred again and they held their babies and, you know, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. I happened to talk to the guy the next season. He called me to see if, uh, if, uh, if he had, hey, doc, do you have a remedy for uh, coughing and snotting noses? And I said, well, like, what happened? Well, everybody got pregnant, nobody aborted, all the babies were fine. 
but the babies and some of the mamas were having snotty noses now. And so when we talk about where symptoms go, you know, from deep it, it, interior disarray to more superficial symptoms, we saw that happen in these guys, you know, instead of like being dead or, or aborting a baby, now we just had upper respiratory kinds of things. So um, I prescribed for that, um, for that situation. It happened to be a pulsatilla case, sent him some pulsatilla for the snotty, um, for the snotty noses and, and, you know, everybody was happy. The longer term pro prognosis, and I don't like that, well, everybody was happy kind of situation, because we know the longer term prognosis is going to be that things are going to wobble and fall down again, because there's so much underlying issue with the management and the hygiene there. But we also know the fact that those animals had seen these remedies, it's going to make them more resilient to, <clears throat> to those issues. And so their, their entire health is going to be elevated, so maybe they'll be able to handle those issues better uh, than, than they could have in the past. The other thing, um, oh, by the way, doc, way in the end of all of this stuff, these crazy goats had been diagnosed with Q fever somewhere at one of the universities and somebody forgot to call the guys and actually talk to them about how Q fever is zoonotic and we need to worry about it in humans and and uh, you know, we had a, an, an Amish family with lots of kids and, and um, you know, mom of childbearing age and, and that sort of stuff. So that was a bit of a, for me, that was a bit of a, of a shocker, but had, you know, fortunately had no other untoward sequela to that. So what did that cost? The clinician's time uh, for consulting with these guys and repertorizing and assessing cost about $120. The cost of the remedy was at that point in time, $12 and 50 cents. And the client's time or the follow-up by probably about $25 worth of follow-up and the client's time. I don't know what the client's time was worth, but you guys figure out, you know, you can, I, I mean, I've built those kinds of solutions, dilutions, filling buckets and that sort of stuff. And, and you can do that in less than half an hour. So, so, you know, so whatever your half an hour's worth of time is worth to, to do that. They didn't have to catch anybody, put them in the chutes, chase anybody down, nothing like that. They just did their day-to-day -day stuff, but changed how they watered. So, so that, that whole scenario cost us somewhere in the neighborhood of $150 to treat. Uh, the next season cost them another, you know, $12.50 for the, for the pulsatilla and cost them maybe $30 for the, the, the recheck. So we're still in there at under $200. And, and um, he didn't have to hold, hold his milk. He didn't have to, you know, so all in all, I think that was a, that was a win-win. And, and you guys can do the math in your head about, about what he probably had in this situation uh, as far as all the diagnostics and work and everything for, for all of the solutions that weren't working well. This is a case that we talked about. Um, we talked about uh, Wednesday, it's the 10 acres of catfish. Uh, these fish had some mystery catfish disease. They were all coming to the surface. They were gasping, they were gaping, holding their mouths open like that at the surface. And, and then they die. They had lots of conventional medicine. They had lots of management changes. They had lots of input and they were down to the place that they were either gonna, they were gonna bulldoze the stuff. And indeed this person was a friend of a colleague of mine, uh, an excellent homeopathic historian, um, my late friend, Julian Winston. And Julian was in Australia and she was lamenting she was gonna have to bulldoze all of her uh, catfish ponds. And he said, well, why don't you call Sue and see what happens? So she called me from Australia and we had a conversation about these guys. And the unique thing about these dying fish that had all sorts of common dying catfish symptoms was, or she called me from Texas. I mean, they had spots on their forehead and asthmatic respiration. And that's what I built the prescription on. We medicated the 10 acres of fish by sending her the famous dropper bottle of the remedy. Uh, she put the dropper bottle into a jar of water, which she then put into five gallons, just the way the goats were done. And then she put that into the, the circulation pump in her ponds. She knew how long it took to circulate from point A all the way through the ponds and back again. And we did that. And so we essentially medicated all the fish that way. And, and, you know, as I said, we had a real positive outcome to that. 
they fairly quickly within 24 hours uh, quit dying. Uh, within 48 hours or so, they quit gaping and gasping. And, and over a period of a week or so, 10 days, um, we, we had a, a really lovely response. The cost of that therapeutic intervention, the clinician's time for the consultation and the repertorization and the assessment probably was about three quarters of an hour. It's around $80 for that. The remedy cost her, um, the remedy cost her $12.50. Uh, you know, it took whatever time it took to mix it up and, and dispense it and do the observation and the follow-up. So, so she was into a nice solution for that, for that situation for, um, you know, at that time, a few years ago, but at that time it was, you know, $100 or so. And I have, again, uh, no actual idea what the value of 10 acres of catfish is. Um, uh, I do know I've had co conversations with clinicians, colleagues of mine, who have dairies with veterinary bills that are bigger than my clinic gross was of that year. It was really, you know, it was, it's really something when you think about how many dollars people spend um, on, on medicines in, in their herds. And some of you guys may be familiar with that. My last case um, is the is the shipping fever cow case. And I left all the slides in um, so that when we send this out to people who look at this, that they get a sense of it. Um, this was not my case. It was a colleague of mine's case, uh, practices in Maine. Uh, it was not these cows, but it was a similar type of herd. Uh, Grass-based, uh, the people were uh, not certified, but they had been spending in the last couple of years uh, doing much more natural medicines, increasing the forage and, and uh, decreasing the vaccinations and, and doing a lot more of the management and hygiene things. And, and um, this was a closed herd. It's shipping fever because that's what we call it. They were not shipped anywhere. Um, this, this, uh, they presented with um, was 50 cows in milk and probably 60 or so uh, young stock. Uh, dry cows and a couple of springing heifers. They were coughing, they were off feed, they had decreased milk production. And we'll just flip through these early slides. Again, it wasn't this herd, but this is to remind us all that, that just because I'm talking about dairy cows doesn't mean that we can't treat shipping fever in beef cows or sheep and goats, or like that case we had on, on, on um, Wednesday with that big group, you know, those 60 or 70 head of feeder pigs, you know, that all spiked their temperatures and started thumping and, and stuff. We, the approach is exactly, exactly, exactly the same. So we know that, that these, were the, these were the symptoms. Again, when we're doing this kind of treatment, we don't want to treat the common symptoms. We don't consider those when we do our analysis to pick the remedy medicine. So the fact that they had cool ears and they were off feed and they, they had noisy lungs and they milk production tank, those are not significant symptoms. Those are sick cow symptoms. The things that are unique to this group is that they had big high temperatures, uh, previously quiet, easy to work with herd, was really anxious. They had this dry cough. They had super rapid rep respirations and they were drinking and drinking and drinking. And, and indeed they were in a tie stall, you know, with a water bowl that shares between the tie stalls. And these cows were like beaten on each other to, to try and get in, into, the, into the watering frame. So looking at that analysis uh, and realizing that there was a big weather change, big storms and the front had come through in the, in the previous day or so, it cho chose the first remedy of aconite for all those cows. That's our day one report. We know that some improved, some didn't change, and some made new symptoms. So the ones that improved, uh, we didn't do anything with. The ones that didn't change, we gave them another dose of remedy. And the ones that made new symptoms, we looked at the new symptoms and repertorized them. And, and so we added the friction rub and the big uh, and expiration and the reluctance to move when they were breathing and that kind of stiff posture when they were coughing. We added that to the group got a new remedy called bryonia. Bryonia is a great remedy. The big, it doesn't matter what you're doing in a bryonia state, you don't wanna move. You could have a bryonia mastitis, you don't wanna move. It feels better pushing on the affected parts. So those bryonia mastitises will be laying on the big, ugly looking sore udder that you think, why is she laying on that? And you know, the bryonia cough, cough if it's a human with their, with their arms around them because they don't wanna move, they won't wanna get up. They don't want to move and they're going to be really, 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 really thirsty. So again, 
Same thing, looked at those again, that's what we did. Um, treatment plan, we dosed those cows individually. Day two, we got the, the continued improvement in the first route, one relapsed, had the same symptoms. So we redosed her, group, group. The next group we had, um, uh, most of them improved, one had new symptoms and that new bryonia group, we got, uh, all of them were improved. So we're gonna wait on those guys. The new symptoms on those, on those uh, um, repeat the aconite group, uh, they, one cow had diarrhea. So added in the diarrhea, the thirstiness, uh, her behavior in there, came up with phosphorus as the remedy, gave her an individual dose of phosphorus. The other guys that have improved, you don't need to do anything with. Um, the guys that had the new symptom, we dose them and uh, and there we go. That's just a summary that we just talked about that, but it's kind of neater. But on, on day three, uh, what we saw happening was some of those bryonia cows, they had a little bit of improvement, but they got stuck. So we dosed them again. The phosphorus cow, the new phosphorus cow, she was improved, so we waited. And everybody in the first group and the third group, we wait because they're all improved. And now we're seeing stuff in the other barn and, and go in and treat those guys uh, for the symptoms that they're showing, the symptoms of the epidemic and the subgroups within the epidemic. So day six, everybody's improved. Milk's back to normal. They didn't have any new illnesses. Two of the older cows started showing some symptoms um, and, and um, they got treated individually. And uh, the clinician went in and redid a month later, redid a big herd health. I mean, she rectaled everybody in the group and found out that everybody was still pregnant. Everybody was still cycling and, and that they don't have any abnormal reproductive things. Usually with big shipping fevers like this, they're going to slip calves and get all cocked up in the reproductive cycle and the early pregnancies aren't going to stick and, and that sort of stuff. The other rest of the story, as we said on Wednesday, there weren't any dead cows. Usually in situations like this in the herd about that size, you're going to get one or two dead. Uh, they don't have to withhold any milk because of the medicines they use. And, and you know, depending conventionally, depending you're going to use, you know, three to seven plus days of withholding, depending on the meds you might have used. In this situation, the milk production also stayed fairly high. It was below their normal, but it was way, way um, higher than, than we would expect typically. And it was back up to pre-pandemic levels or pre-epidemic levels um, within a week. Usually the production just tanks to nothing. And then it takes you know a couple or three or four weeks to get up to normal. And then the cost of the treatment um, was, was um, uh, a third of uh, the conventional treatment. So I want to talk a little bit about both of the paradigms, the conventional paradigm and the homeopathy land paradigm. We all talk the same way about farm hygiene and that sort of stuff in preventing outbreaks, nutrition and feed quality, water quality, housing. It doesn't necessarily have to be inside, but it's got to be dry and it's got to be comfortable. And if it's outside, we got to feed them differently because it takes energy to stay warm. And, and, and if they're cold and wet, it takes even way more energy. And we, we know that air quality and ventilation and everything is really important. Sanitation, genetics make a difference. Um, humane handling and species appropriate housing and biosecurity, not just biosecurity like like you know, keeping everybody out of your farm, but also biosecurity in the herd. So not going from from old to young. You're like always working from the the youngest group out to the older group. Not going back and forth between groups. If you got sick cows, deal with your healthy ones first, and then do your sick ones. Don't carry your your bucket back and forth between the groups. All those things that are practical, but we tend to forget them sometimes. So the cost analysis, as we've been going through, um, we've got the professional veterinary services or the services of, of the clinician or whoever's doing your advisory work for you. We've got the cost of the homeopathic medicines um, and the conventional medicines. We have the no milk withdrawal 
from sale versus the milk withdrawn from sale. So whatever the value of that milk that didn't get sold is, um, is, is part of the cost analysis and also the decrease in milk sale revenue through the course of the disease as, as well. So those things all have to be considered. This is a little messy graph and it, it's, my, my colleagues, it's my colleagues graph looking at the, the, the professional services. These are by days, um, the, this didn't paste, I'm sorry. These are by days down the left-hand column in that turquoise thing. So the professional services, um, the cost of the medications on day two, uh, day one, day two, day one, day two, day three, and, and then the days um, that milk wasn't in the tank and the days of milk from residue withdrawal and milk losses. So it cost them the first day that my colleague went on that farm and wrangled that and they inspect, they didn't, they didn't examine all 50 sick cows because they were all doing the same stuff. They examined six or eight cows and took the case from there. And, and she was happy because they were, they were really anxious and tough to handle. But first day's expenses for, for that group were $450. Second day with her time and the, the medicine to change the medicine was, was $170. Third day, same. Fourth day um, and the follow-up was, was less because she's doing phone, phone follow-ups and that, and that sort of stuff. So for the whole outbreak, it, it cost the, them to treat that barn uh, $1,010. Now that doesn't in that doesn't include the loss of production stuff it was the but it was the 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 treatment itself and and again i didn't realize this whole thing didn't paste uh, when i transitioned my slides looking at this cost uh looking at the cost of of drugs you can see that there the only thing that you can't see clearly is the is the uh um cumulative amount. So the, the doctor cost, the veterinarian cost was the same. The, the cost of the drugs was, you know, um, looking at $80 the first day, $960 because they'd be adding, uh, they'd be adding the antibiotics and perhaps some non-steroidals. Um, they'd be uh, tanking some milk because, uh, because of the uh, residues from those medications and we'd also be looking at the mortality cost typically is about two percent in in these kind of shipping fever herds and so so the cost for conventional treatments speculative costs but you know she's treated them like that they the the local vets have treated them like that for years is is about thirty three hundred and and eighty dollars so just and that's just sort of time and out out expenses thing so we look at we look at the optimal health and the and the full milk production and no effective effects of the epidemic and no mortalities at a third the cost. It's a it's a win win. So as you move along through what's next, part of it is just like doing your holistic management planning. Like what what's your goal? You know, is your goal to transition your entire livestock operation to treating with homeopathic medicines? Uh, is your goal, well, this was interesting, but I don't think it's for me. Is your goal that my livestock health with medicines is not either a log jam or a weak link at my current farmer ranch? And, and so this is interesting, but, but it doesn't really apply to me because I got better places to spend my time and energy. Um, you know, and, and indeed, if you've got a choice between improving your grazing management and, and your stewardship, and buying drugs, be they conventional drugs or homeopathic drugs, I would spend your time and energy on that other stuff usually, uh, that, that sort of thing. So you've really, really got to look at your goals. Do we want to fix stuff that's broken? Do we want to figure out about things that before they're broken? Do we want to strengthen the individual or strengthen the herd? Do we want to decrease our susceptibility? Um, you know, are we trying to ice on health uh, I, I work with a lot of people, it, it doesn't last long usually, but with a lot of people that you know, want to quote, go natural. Um, it's one of the reasons that I, you know, basically quit doing acupuncture because 
they all wanted to go natural, but they didn't want to change anything else. So they thought that by going natural, they could ice health on a really broken system. And, and in my opinion, and in my experience, that doesn't work real well. We want to, we want to foster health and, and nurture health and, and that sort of thing. You need some physical supplies. The biggest things you need are your decisions and priorities and your sense of direction and the time to do this and the rejuvenation and, and desire to study with it. We all need the common sense. John Prine was right. It don't make no sense that common sense don't make no sense no more. You're gonna have to look at your animals in a different way than you might be. You might, you might be still already looking at them like this, but it's really the simple things that, that make sense. You need some handling facilities, the basic things of thermometers and stethoscopes so we can make observations, other observations besides that with our eyes, syringes and dosing supplies. If you don't know what's going on, look at one of their buddies and it always helps to have you know, a plan and some good helpers. That's to remind you what the remedy medicines commonly look like. We talked about how to give the remedy through this, through this, um, through this presentation and, and also always, always, I, my bias is to always mix it up in water because it's way easier to dispense. There's really nice homeopathic remedy kits available. It's a very, very cost-effective way to get a lot of remedies in your, in your, uh, in your pharmacy for, you know, there they are all, they're collected. They're not rolling around in the glove compartment or something like that. <clears throat> the Materia Medicas are the dictionaries of remedies. You need those. You need to be able to look up the remedies and read about the characteristics. And same so with the repertories, which are dictionaries of symptoms and their modifiers. And we need to look these symptoms up. This stuff doesn't come just like out of your head sort of thing. The, the, we actually do gather up the symptoms and, and, and look at the remedies and, and choose them. There's lots of references. We use a lot of human references. Uh, it works very well. There's printed stuff. Uh, Kent's repertory is a great place to start. Clark's Materia Medicine is a great place to start for printed material. They're both really inexpensive, depending on where you buy them. You can get them for, you know, six or ten dollars, and maybe twenty or thirty dollars for the three volume Materia Medica. There's lots of electronic stuff. Homeoint.org is a great reference. They've got all sorts of out of copyright older references on their website. Um, when you land on that site, Homeo Int, H O M E O I N T dot O R G. It's going to be in French, but there'll be a little flag that says change to English, and, and you'll see the material there. We've also got good historical references. Right now, one of the best sources for, for remedy kits is Washington Homeopathics. Um, their homeopathyworks.com. Jim Clemmer, who was a natural health supply um, homeopathic pharmacy, uh, has closed recently. Jim require, uh, retired and the transition has been very incomplete there to somebody taking over that. Um, you can purchase individual homeopathic medicines and establish your own pharmacies. Remember that there isn't an expiration date on these, on these medicines. These are some commonly used remedies that you know, if you're going to just go buy something to have them on hand, the, the, this is the aconite, arnica, arsenicum, belladonna, bryonia, calcarea, lachesis, lycopodium, exvomica, pulsatilla, silica, sulfur are pretty common. This is just a reminder that, you know, when you want to lie down and cry because you're so frustrated about it, uh, the only way to do this is get good at it. And, and don't try and treat your hardest cases first. Treat the easy stuff. Take your baby steps, just like this little calf. You know, you're not going to go out and, and do, do the big stuff um, right away quick. Um, but, but I think as you start and get to know remedies and get to know, you know, what they look like in different states, I think it's really possible to be successful prescribing on the farm. In the last half a second, Lynn, just want to remind people that the AGA, we're going to have a six-part um, you know, practical homeopathy for the farm and ranch um, and for people too, because all this stuff works for humans as well as animals uh, that will be, that we'll be uh, uh, doing uh, fairly quickly after this conference uh, closes. And, and uh, there'll be practical exercises and you know, homework and uh, casework and that sort of stuff, just to help people be much more successful in their homeopathic prescribing. <clears throat>